our healthcare resources just seem to be incapable of keeping up. We've got uh, in Calgary an urgent care center that's been reducing its hours. Uh, one in you know north of the city that's shut down for weekends. I believe in the East Coast we're seeing uh, again hospitals and such that just don't have the the staff or the ability to keep up. But still, we aren't hearing discussion on the system, and that, that's where yeah. I get concerned. You know, we're in a very, very difficult situation right now. As you said, you know, there are, there are eras closing across the country. Um, we have um, many, you know, physicians who are, who are leaving uh, the system. There are situations where nurses are burnt out. Uh, and of course, none of it is, is, is really their fault. They've had an incredibly difficult two years. Um, but it is, it, it, is, uh, it is a tough situation right now that, that should not be taken lightly. It's probably, you know, the first reaction would be to, to kind of put all of the blame or the onus on, on COVID-19. And certainly COVID has, um, has pushed the system to its limits and exacerbated a lot of the problems. But to really understand what's going on, we actually need to roll back the clock a little bit to 2019 before COVID was there, because then we can start to disentangle what's due to COVID and what's actually due to our system. Um, and one of the things that we can do is is, is look at uh, one of our studies, um, actually quite a few of our studies uh, in 2019 that look at data for Canada compared to other countries uh, in the OECD, specifically countries with universal healthcare. And what we find is that Canada for the longest time is routinely ranked amongst the top spenders, but we aren't seeing value coming out of that spending, at least not to a commensurate level. Uh, we routinely rank, you know, either um, second highest as, as a percentage uh, of GDP after adjusting for age or um, eighth highest um, in terms of per capita. Again, that's out of 28 um, universal healthcare systems or so really amongst the top. Uh, but when we look at the numbers for physicians, we were you know, right at the bottom. We were ranked 26 out of 28 for physicians. You know, we are ranked 14th out of 28 for nurses and we were ranked 25th out of 26 for beds. So even in 2019, this is the picture of the system that was already pushed to the limits. And we experienced those limits during COVID-19. And we've seems like we're starting to fall off that precipice. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate that, yeah, you know, COVID's kind of exacerbated a problem we already knew we had, or at least those of us watching the system knew. Uh, but I mean, so if we're going to look at systemic reform, hopefully some people are ready to start, you know, at least poking into it because we turned it into a bit of a sacred cow and, and people don't discuss it. But we've got to accept that there's got to be some changes. But that, that key word that a lot of people miss is universal. I mean, that, that's the value everybody wants, I, I believe, in Canada. They don't want to move away from that. They're fearful that we could move into a system where they wouldn't be covered any longer. But that's not what anybody's proposing at any point. No, and, and you know one of, one of the things we've done very purposefully in, in our report is only looking at countries with the universal healthcare, and I think uh, it's it's a little uh, it's a little sad that that the discussion in both Canada and the United States tends to focus on each other a lot of the time. Uh, you know, the United States loves to you know uh, well I'm not saying the United States in general, but a lot of a lot of defenders of their system seem to uh, you know want to rail against Canada's wait times very specifically and say, well, that's how all universal healthcare systems look. And in Canada, you say, you look out at the board and say, oh, you know, we don't want to import the problems that we see in the United States. And really, we're just putting blinders on ourselves. I mean, there, there are countries like Switzerland, the Netherlands, Germany, uh, France, all of these countries have universal health care. They're spending about the same as we do, but they have remarkably more doctors. They have more uh, nurses. They have more beds. And of course, all of them uh, had the same struggles with COVID-19, maybe to some varying degree. But they were starting at a very different baseline. You know, I have, I have some interesting numbers uh, when we're looking at um, wait times for elective surgery. Um, this is from the Commonwealth Fund. And it reported that in 2020, 62% of Canadians were able to get surgery within four months for elective surgery. By contrast, in Switzerland, 94% of patients were able to get treatment within that time frame. And in Germany, 99%. And before even then, you know, 2020 is, is again getting into COVID ter territory. But if you look at 2016, the numbers were basically almost the same. In fact, in 2016, 0% of German patients were waiting uh, longer than, than four weeks um, for elective surgery. So, so these are all countries with universal health care um, that don't seem to have the long wait time that we do. Uh, and in some cases are actually spending the same or lower than Canada is. So the key really is, is not about spending which is unfortunately what a lot of the, not a lot, well, all of the current premiers are advocating for with their increased um, CSG transfers. But it's really about what is happening to the spending. Why, aren't, why is it not translating into more doctors? Why is it not translating uh, into shorter wait times? Uh, and what can we change in our policies? And what's stopping us from changing those policies right now? 
Yeah, well, I imagine the answer to the question of what's stopping us is, is the Canada Health Act. Uh, it needs some changes to allow the flexibility to make some policy changes. But let's say, assuming you know the, the government's receptive to opening the act uh, and changing some of these things, what sort of changes could we implement then that, that would help us move more towards those sorts of outcomes like Germany you know, in a universal system? Well, when we look at the, the, the basket of countries that generally perform better than Canada, uh, there are three things they, that they do very differently. The first is their general attitude towards the private sector. And that is looking at the private sector as a tool, either as a partner to deliver on the universal healthcare promise or as a pressure valve to kind of um, you know, serve as a, as a way out once the public system's overburdened. The second thing that they do differently is that they generally expect patients to share in the cost of treatment. Now, this is you know, something like maybe a three to $400 deductible. It could be 10% of the cost of treatment. Of course, they understand that they need to be limits so that there's never a financial burden. So there's an annual cap on payments. Uh, there are exemptions for vulnerable populations. Um, and the third thing that they do differently is they fund their hospitals based on activity. And what that does is that ensures that money is actually following the patient through the system. In Canada, because we have this sort of, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, a government monopoly over the financing and delivery of care, um, we have these global budgets, which the incentive structure is such that patients are treated as a cost to the system because every time a patient comes in, they're eating into that budget. Contrast that with activity-based funding and money is following the patients. The problem is that you know you, you can't implement any one of these and expect um, healthcare to be magically fixed. It's, it's probably a palette of these options because each of them temper each other. The cost sharing sort of tempers demand, the activity-based funding uh, ensures that supply is, is, is reacting dynamically. Uh, but the thing is right now, we're in such a risk-averse environment because of the Canada Health Act um, that, you know, if provinces even try to do something, um, you know, the federal government usually is, is coming down and clamping on them and saying, hey, you're violating the act or you may violate the act and we're going to penalize you for it. And that's very unfortunate because one of the one of the most successful experiments um, was in Saskatchewan with the Saskatchewan Surgical Initiative, where they partnered with private clinics um, to deliver third party um, uh, day, day surgeries within the public system. Um, they also had a pooled patient referral system where, you know, patients go into a central pool and they're referred to the uh, physician with the shortest wait time. Uh, and they had a number of other changes. And that actually resulted in Saskatchewan going from a province with one of the longest wait times to one of the shortest by 2014 or 15. But ultimately, it started to, their wait times started to go up again after that because they couldn't do any more reforms because governments, the federal government started to say, hey, if you try anything now, we're going to actually penalize you um, by, by wielding the Canada Health Act. And that's not the sort of you know, incentive structure that you want. You want provinces to try the best that they can to experiment with different policies, to try and see what they can do, because they really have the interests of their residents at heart. So you know, don't, don't stop them. Encourage them to try things that will, that will result in, in, in better or quicker treatment. Yeah, well, it's unfortunate the way our, our country's kind of laid out, I guess, with jurisdiction. Uh, the, the federal government is the regulator with the Canada Health Act. They sort of impose the rules, but then they dump it on the province and says, okay, but it's up to you guys to deal with everything else. You've got to deliver it. You've got to set up the infrastructure. You've got to re recruit the uh, staff. And it, it's just sort of a catch-22 as it sits there. Each can kind of deny responsibility. I mean, likewise, a, a province can also say, well, it's not my fault. It's the, the, the Health Act. And, and the federal government say, well, it's not our problem. It's the province. But, of course, it's the consumers who always lose in the end. You're right. You know, I mean, uh, th there's actually a lot that provinces can do within the confines of the CHA as well. Some of the things like activity-based funding, it's, it's no problem. Um, and there are provincial legislations that actually uh, sometimes go far beyond the Canada Health Act. But I would go back to it because the thing is, ultimately, the Canada Health Act is so vague that it can be interpreted by the federal government of the day to be contributing any aspect of it, particularly um, with with the section about reasonable access. So it's it's just, you know, you don't want a risk averse environment when you're talking about policy. You want a policy where you say, look, what, what, what we care about is the patient and the system comes secondary. Unfortunately, we're in a situation where the system is given priority and the patients come secondary. It's it's backwards. So, I mean, you know, I, I know this gets you, you work more into the policy and the alternatives, but I mean, I, I believe, you know, politicians are typically driven by demand from the people they want to get reelected. I mean, if we could see more public will, people saying, hey, we want to see some systematic reform, the politicians are going to act on it. But that's a really, uh, there's some really entrenched uh, mythologies, I guess, about our current system and a few things that have to be 
uh, chipped away at before enough people are ready to say, yeah, let, let, let's try some different stuff out. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not a political pundit at all. And, and you know, I, I often am reminded of those 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 New Yorker cartoons where, where, where politicians are, are leading from behind and saying, hey, you know, I see where the crowd's going and let me let me please lead you there now. Um, but but I do I do think that there is a lot of reform coming from the ground up, because the thing is, um, at, at the fundamental point, once Canadians have information, once they understand that there are other ways to do it, once they understand what's happening with the system, um, they start to they start to demand change, and you see this happening in a variety of different ways. You see it happening, uh, you know, with things like the Canby court case in, in British Columbia, where Dr. Dr. Brian Day, who's the former head of the, uh, the Canadian Medical Association, is fighting with um, alongside um, a number of patients to to simply get get the right to treat them uh, within his hospital. Uh, you know, and, and you see it. Uh, you've seen it already in Quebec with the 2005 um, Chevrolet decision. Um, and then you also see it happening at, in, at a real, you know, um, uh, just a, just a, a, a normal reactionary level with, you know, Canadians starting to look towards things like virtual care and, um, and, and, video, uh, and video appointments, which in many ways really circumvents the entire restrictions of the CHA. And, and you're starting to see, um, I would say, a, a lot of um, defenders of the status quo are now starting to clamp down on, 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 on virtual care and private care, which really had been Quite a lot, a huge help during during COVID nineteen, uh, but the thing is, I, I think that that will be a futile fight because the thing is, you can you can perhaps try and clamp down on these on these appointments within a doctor and a patient within Canada, but there's nothing that's going to stop uh, a patient in Canada trying to get an appointment with a doctor in South Africa if that's the only way that they're going to get that consultation, unless you build you know uh, some sort of uh, some sort of a firewall, which would which would be an entirely different story. So. Yes, I'm a firm believer in, in, in Canadians and, and their ability to embrace and process information uh, and demand change um, because, you know, fundamentally, this is about their healthcare and they are the peers for it. Well, that's it. When times get tough enough, well, people suddenly can, can become more receptive to changing anyways. It's unfortunate that it has to go down before it can come up. But when you realize you can't get yourself a physician or can't get uh, treatment in a timely manner, and, uh, you know, you start looking at things and realize, well, it's not for lack of expenditure. I mean, we're, you know, Canadians aren't fools. They, they'll start pressuring the right way, hopefully. So I guess the more conversations we can have and showing people like there's, again, it's not that polarized thing. There's much more than a Canadian American world out there. Uh, we could start getting our policymakers examining some more innovative options soon, I hope. Absolutely. You know, this is, this is really about, you know, uh, universal health care. Um, that is that is trying to yeah. trying to uh, ensure that there's timely access to treatment, regardless of financial ability to pay. And there are at least, you know, it's, it's sort of like Baskin Robbins. There's just like at least 27 other flavors of universal healthcare, and we're just we have the blinders on. We're focused on Canada versus the United States. It's you know betting on the two horses that are coming last in the race and forgetting about you know the top three or top four of the performances. Uh, unfortunately, you're right. We're we're in a situation where we're now being forced to make these changes because because our, our healthcare system isn't isn't uh, you know able to uh, keep up with it and we've been talking about this for 10 years and unfortunately this is the situation that's that's brought it to uh, brought it to the fore but um, but you know again we, we have an ability to work on it right now and I would say start doing it right now before wait times go even further than what we're you know our, our, our last measure of wait times is 25.6 weeks between referral from a GP to getting treatment, um, according to a national survey. We've been doing that since 1993. And at that time, that wait time was 9.3 weeks. That's an increase of 175%. If you want to take out COVID from that, the wait time in 2019 was 20 point, I think 20.6 weeks. This is a fundamental systemic issue that has been really pushed and exacerbated by COVID-19. And we've got to tackle it before it really becomes uh, you know, a dangerous situation in the future. It's not going to get better without without some effort. Without doubt. well, thank you very much for the the work you do and, and you know putting those studies out there and such and, and for speaking to us today. So uh, before I let you go, where, where can people find more information on the work you've done and and uh, you know see some of those alternatives for healthcare provision out there? All of our information is free and publicly available at FraserInstitute.org. Great. Well, I thank you again, and uh, well, hopefully we will start seeing some positive changes soon. I really do appreciate your work, and uh, hopefully we can talk again down the road. Thanks so much for having me on the show.